Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, has the uh, has the indictment magic sort of worn off yet, or did all the RICO talk still get you going? Uh, it's kind of magic every time, mm. I have to say. The RICO, the kind of, you know, large-scale criminal conspiracy mafia-style indictment uh, was sweet. more satisfying to read than the other ones, I think. Yeah, know? it was. I mean, yeah. I feel like the classified documents one is, like, open and shut. But this was this did sort of get at the broader scope of what they did and how disgusting and pernicious I think what it was. was great about this is like the other ones, you know, it's kind of centered around these individualized crimes, right? Like there was a payment to Stormy Daniels, albeit then this kind of complicated conspiracy around it, mm-hmm. stealing classified documents, some cover up around it, Jack Smith by the book. This is like you know, we all know the call the the Georgia Secretary of State and oh my god, they had them dead to rights, but the amount of detail about like, you know, like forging documents and like yeah. leaning on people and hacking computers. Yeah, hacking computers. It felt very um yeah, very, very like mob movie. Do you know the um, Raffensburger call is one hour long? Like we hear that like I just need to find eleven thousand votes clip all the time, but he just leaned on his ass for a full hour. Are you ever on a call like that and you start like, you know, scanning Twitter, check like scores on ESPN? You know, like yeah. I wonder what he was doing about forty five minutes in that call, like just checking his email. Oh, Raffensburger? Yeah, Raffensburger. Yeah, just be yeah, like, like, yo, this is recording, right? <laughs> we got this on tape. <laughs> this yeah. is the... Some serious force. I do I mean the the brief world though piece of this is like I we should do a segment at a certain point about how this looks around the oh, world absolutely. because this is going to be like totally insane to have all these cases coming you know above water next year during our election usually american elections are things that people follow closely now they're going to have to follow like four trials and um, yeah i think we all underappreciate the degree to which us based news uh, gets covered internationally for example i love the bbc world podcast they've been doing nonstop trump coverage but also hawaii fires coverage yeah. which is interesting yeah americas is pretty good bbc yeah, that's very too good. Very good. um yeah no th- I, I imagine that this is not our finest hour in terms of our global reputation but completely humiliating yeah. completely yeah. humiliating well we got a great show for you today regardless of our humiliation we're going to cover this <laughs> hostage deal between the us and iran a scary election result in Argentina and the murder of a candidate in Ecuador. The latest from Niger, uh, a little trip inside the foreign policy mind of the 2024 presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, China's economy, Biden's meeting at Camp David, and then hallucinations. And then, Ben, you did the interview that we're airing this week with an incredibly brave guy named Bobby Wine. Can you tell us a little about yeah, him? Yeah, really excited. We had uh, Bobby in studio here. Um, and Bobby's a former like pop star, musician, actor, cultural figure in Uganda, goes into politics, gets elected to parliament, decides to challenge Museveni, the basically dictatorial autocrat, uh, aging uh, autocrat of Uganda in a presidential election, faces all kinds of harassment, intimidation, imprisonment, torture, all of it. You name it. He went through it. He still, frankly, despite what was clearly widespread fraud and intimidation, you know, came pretty close in that election. Mm-hmm. Um, and now he's told his story in this documentary, uh, Bobby Wine, the People's President, which is amazing because they kind of followed him throughout the campaign. So mm-hmm. they have all this footage of him and his wife, Barbie, who joined us in the interview. People should listen to this to hear what it's like, what kind of decision making goes into deciding to put your neck on the line. What's it like to be you know, in a family trying to make change um, while you're dealing with such personal hardship. Barbie and Bobby are both like incredibly eloquent and powerful about speaking about, you know, how they decided to take these risks. Um, And then we talk about the coup in Niger. We Mm -hmm. talk about um, the state of democracy in Africa generally, uh, what Russia is trying to do. So we covered a lot of ground. People should definitely check this one out. And check out the doc. It's uh, good people made it. Um, Worldos made it. Nice. Uh, I was glad to know that. Hell yeah. Um, So uh, people should definitely, it's in theaters now. Um, so if, if it's in your neighborhood, in your city, check it out. If not, I'm sure it'll be streaming at some point. This yeah, year. for sure. Okay, Ben, so time is a flat circle. Let's talk about the U.S. and Iran deal uh, that will free five American hostages from Iran's notorious even prison. In exchange, the U.S. will release, I believe, five Iranians serving uh, sanctions related prison time in the U.S. and eventually give Iran access to $6 billion in frozen oil revenue. It's sort of a sequential deal. Iran released the U.S. hostages from even prison to house arrest in a hotel. They're going to be held there for several weeks before being allowed to to leave the country. That cushion, that time, allows the U.S. to go through the crazy process of transferring $6 billion worth of Iranian uh, assets being held in South Korea to an account 
at the Central Bank of Qatar. Qatar will control that account and only allow Iran to use the funds to buy humanitarian supplies. One of these American hostages, uh, Sia Namazi, has been held since 2015, so like a long time coming for these these men and women and their families. Uh, the deal took months to negotiate. It was mediated by Oman, Qatar, and Switzerland. A lot of folks, I imagine you and me included, Ben, hope that this could lead to a broader set of diplomatic talks between the U.S. and Iran that could get us back into some sort of JCPOA-like, but probably a lot less comprehensive and ambitious nuclear agreement. Uh, The good news on that front is the U.S. and Iranian officials are speaking directly now before I think they're doing it all through Oman. So that's a step forward. It also sounds like Iran has slowed their nuclear enrichment work slightly, at least. So fingers crossed. Very curious uh, about what the Saudis and Israelis say and do about all of this. The whole thing might feel a little jarring to listeners because last week we were talking about the U.S. putting Marines on boats in the Strait of Hormuz to physically fight off uh, Iranian ships attacking tankers. But, you know, good news is good news. So, um, Ben, Republicans are responding in the most predictable ways possible. They're calling it appeasement and saying this money is going to be used to fund terrorism. It will not. What's your take on the substance of the deal itself? In level of PTSD, uh, imagining, uh, defending, and sort of dealing with the politics of any kind of deal with Iran. Well, it's a complicated process. And and as we said last week, even about the Straits of Hormuz, like sometimes you flex a little bit militarily, you show your kind of hardline cards at the same time you're trying to get something done diplomatically. So I actually don't know that those are as whiplashy as they seem. Um, Look, in terms of what the terms of this deal are... um, we have to point this out because it'll be demagogued and misrepresented um, by all the professional Iran critics and disingenuous Republicans. The money that Iran is slated to receive is not American money. This is what we went through in the Obama and the Iran deal. It was like we were giving them a check for X billions cash, of dollars. Yeah. No, this is money that they've had held in South Korea because they sold oil to South Korea, but the sanctions kind of ca- caught that money in the in, in the net. Um, and so we're facilitating their capacity to access their own money. So that's the first thing. This is their money, not our money. Um, Second, um, they are setting up this mechanism through Qatar, wherein they're only using that funding, as you said, for things like food and medicine, so things that have purely humanitarian purposes. Um, So that's the facts of, of what's taking place here. Now, the critics will say, well, you know, if they have this amount of money for food and other things, maybe they can divert other money to the military. Like the reality of the Iranian system is that they like they fund a lot of their military through black market, right. through, it's through off book it's, stuff. It's yeah. off book stuff. Like um, so, you know, even that I think uh, kind of misrepresents how the Iranian system works to some extent. Um, Iran does have huge humanitarian challenges, so. Um, this money is like a drop in the ocean of what they actually need to to improve the circumstances of their people. All the sanctions obviously remain in place. So that's on 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 this deal. Now the uh, the people that have been freed into detention in a hotel. I talked to a friend of the pod, Jason Resign. You know, one of his points is just walking out of Avon prison is like a pretty powerful thing in its own. Who was held for five hundred and forty-four days? Five hundred forty-four days. Some of these people, I think, have been held for longer than that. Yeah. You know, so um, so that's a good step. But you want to make sure the reason this is sequenced as it has been is that you know the deal can get scuttled by anybody in that system at any point. And so until these people are wheels up and out of Iranian airspace, this deal is not done. And so they're withholding pieces of this to make sure that those people actually get out. Yeah. Um, so look, that that's the the contours of the deal related to these hostages. Uh, it, it's a good sign of diplomacy working. It's a good sign of like getting something done. It raises the perennial questions about whether we're incentivizing this kind of hostage taking. That is what it is, as we've talked about on mm-hmm. this podcast. You can either try to get people out um, or not. And you know, I think the bias is towards getting people out. On the nuclear question, I think it's clear to me. In talking to people, including the administration, that like this is a different channel, right? So this is the people who negotiated this particular agreement are not also sitting at the same table negotiating a potential nuclear deal. Similar to the last time. It, that's exactly the point. Like last time we had a nuclear negotiation and we had a prisoner's negotiation and they were separate tracks, separate people. But they're inevitably connected in a way because 
part of what you're doing is you're testing, can we get something done? Can both sides implement an agreement? This is a new cast of characters from the last nuclear deal. This is not the Rouhani government, so they're clearly different negotiators on the Iranian side. Um, and so I think that this is kind of a confidence-building measure, and hopefully it foreshadows something on the nuclear deal that, as you said, would likely not be as far-reaching as the JCPOA in rolling back the Iranian program. That's the irony. You can thank Donald Trump for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the irony of people who yelled about sunset provisions, uh, you know, i.e. the Iranians would be allowed to do certain things with their nuclear program in 10 or 15 years. Well, because he pulled out, <laughs> we lost those mm-hmm. things uh, while we had them. But I think what you could look for is... Is there some agreement to kind of freeze the Iranian nuclear program in place, get a verification regime back in so that they're inspectors, Mm -hmm. and hopefully just take that issue of a potential military conflict over the nuclear program off the table for the time being? Now, there are two reasons why I think the politics won't be as bad as last time. Um, The first is that, you know, when we were going through this in 15 and 16, quaint, simpler times, Iran was like the number one issue in the agenda. You know, like this was the dominant story in our political media for like at least six months. And so Republicans were much more like a dog with a bone on it um, because it was the thing in leading the news. This is not the case today. I think, you know, listeners may have barely heard about this, you know. So I just don't think they're going to get as much headway because I just don't think the conversation is about this today. It's about Trump. It's about the Russia-Ukraine war. Yeah, we got a hot war in Europe. Yeah, we got a hot war. So this is not as as front front burner as it was. Um, And look, the other reality of this thing is that uh, when you've done something before, it's not as novel, you know. Um, They're kind of following in like some plowed ground and hopefully they can get something done this nuclear issue and these people can get home and we don't have to worry about a war with Iran for a couple of years. Yeah, you know? fingers crossed, but yeah. really, really important progress. So credit to the Biden team for, for getting this done. This episode of Pod Save the World is brought to you by Kariuma, the cool, sustainable sneaker company with old school style and new school ethics. As summer starts to come to a close, we need a pair of shoes that are versatile, seasonless, and go with everything. With over 40,000 five-star reviews, Kariuma's got you covered with shoes that have a classic look, are crazy comfy, and consciously crafted to transition you from hot summer days to crisp autumn evenings. Worn by celebrities and praised by publications like Vogue and GQ, these kicks are a cult fave and we absolutely love them. And now the Akka we all know and love is made for kids. Akka low kids have Velcro straps and extra cushion for easy, comfortable wear. Match your littles and make it a bundle by adding a pair for you. They're 100% vegan and carefully crafted with organic cotton canvas made for our little tree planters, earth lovers, and mini explorers. I know Charlie Favreau's got a pair of Karyuma kids. Loves them. Loves them. Running around, you know, little velcro in, looking cool. I'm wearing my Karyumas right now, in yeah, fact. And now for a limited time, Pod Save the World listeners can get an exclusive 15% off Karyuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash world to get 15% off. That's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash world for 15% off only for a limited time. Pod Save the World is brought to you by the International Rescue Committee. Over 60 million children are suffering from acute malnutrition, which is linked to almost half of all deaths of children under the age of five. The International Rescue Committee provides life-saving aid, including emergency medical care and nutritional support to children facing starvation in South Sudan, Yemen, Nigeria, and crisis-affected countries all around the world. Uh, The IRC is an incredible organization. Uh, I hope you will consider donating to them if you're considering making a charitable donation this year. There's a lot of need. Donate today by visiting rescue.org slash rebuild. For a limited time, all donations to the IRC will be matched. Give today. Pot Save the World is brought to you by Harry's. What I want in a skincare regime is a razor blade that's sharp and not dull. Uh, because I forgot to go to the store and buy a new one. And that's why Harry's is great, because they send them direct to your door. Whether your ritual is minimal or elevated, level up your shave game with Harry's sleekest razor yet, the craft handle. Experience the latest and greatest in Harry's razor lineup, delivered straight to your door for just $10 at harrys.com slash save the world. Harry's craft handle is a smooth metallic handle that feels weighty and well-balanced in your hand. It's innovatively designed to deliver the same great shave you expect with a killer new look. Grab the Craft Handle starter set for just $10. It includes the Craft Handle 5-blade German-engineered razor cartridge shaving gel and travel cover. Plus, you can schedule replacement blade delivery with refills for as low as $2. Step up your routine even more with dozens of affordable items to choose from, like shaving creams, post-shave balm, body washes, and hydrating lotions. With the highest customer satisfaction in the shaving industry, they're still offering a no-risk trial. 
don't like your shave, no worries. It's on them. Hairs is great. You get a close shave every single time. Uh, the craft handle is comfortable and easy to use and easy to pack. And, you know, look, you always have sharp blades at your disposal and you're never running out to the store. Elevate your shave with the latest and greatest in Harry's razor handle lineup today. Get your $17 craft handle starter set for just $10 at harrys.com slash save the world. That's harrys.com slash save the world. Let's turn to Argentina, Ben, because there was a, a far right libertarian slash, he calls it like an anarchist, basically, named Javier Mille. He won Argentina's presidential primary on Sunday with 30% of the vote. The center left party, the finance minister, took second place with 21% and the conservative party took third with 17%. This was a shocking result for a lot of people. Uh, there will now be a general election in October and potentially a runoff in November if no candidate exceeds the necessary thresholds in that October first round election. The broader context here is that Argentina's economy is in crisis. The country is deeply in debt. Inflation is over 100%. Then I saw a story the other day about how um, Argentina criminalized burning or tearing up its currency because foreign soccer fans were coming to the country, going to <laughs> games and just like torching bills in big mm. stadiums that it, and to taunt people. So, you know, you get huge chunks of the country living in poverty. Uh, and so I think, you know, a lot of them found Miele's radical views and proposals compelling. Those views include uh, eliminating the central bank, getting rid of their currency and replacing it with a dollar, massive spending cuts, privatizing public companies, tax cuts, deregulating guns, making abortion illegal again, and replacing uh, the public health care system with a private one. He has also said insane things in the past where he seemed open to selling children. He's like that committed to capitalism. Uh, I guess he walked that one back, but like, come on, man. Yeah. Uh, he wants to allow people to sell organs because it's a market like any other. So look, it's unlikely that he'll be able to pass a lot of these ideas into law because he won't have majorities in Congress to do so. But I think the fact that you can couple policies that crazy with rhetoric like, quote, we're going to end the useless, parasitic, criminal political caste that is sinking this country and then overperform your polling by 10 percent. Uh, it's a pretty big wake up call, I think, to a lot of like people worried about and fighting back against some of these right wing populists of which he is one. Yeah, I think it's a sign of the times to some extent in like Latin America generally, which we've been talking about with like, increasing frequency. And, and if you think about it, right, the U uh, North America, Europe, you know, South America, these are the most democratic regions in the world. And what's cleared down in Latin America is there's just a complete collapse in confidence in political elites and establishments yeah, in yeah. a lot of different countries, right? Um, because of corruption, because of inequality, because of a sense of, you know, politicians just not delivering on what they say. In Argentina, you've now had successive governments, one was center right, one was center left. Neither of those clearly fit the bill no. because people turn to this guy. And what's interesting is you saw over the last few years, a lot of that energy moved politics in certain countries to the left. Um, so in places like Chile and Colombia, um, and, and to some extent Brazil, although that was tied to Bolsonaro, you had left wing leaders get elected. Um, but I think more than a shift to the left, it was just a re reaction against that you had conservatives in power. People are just looking for something new. Totally. Um, and so we've seen Bukele in El Salvador become a very popular leader that we've talked about. We see this guy coming out of seemingly nowhere um, in Argentina with this kind of weird ideology. But the only the constant, th you know, Petro in Colombia we talked about last week came with a very left wing uh, platform. Uh, Gabriel Boric uh, uh, campaigned for president in Chile on pretty far reaching left wing reforms that, he, you know, he couldn't really get done once he got elected. But what, what all these things have in common is people throwing ideas out that are just that are radical and upending the establishment and mm -hmm. people responding to that, you yeah. know? And so I think what is notable about this trend is that it's just about rejecting the status quo and just want to try something new. Now, the systems in these countries usually prevent, as you said, people from actually implementing their programs, which then in turn seems to feed even more frustration <laughs> and people looking for different people. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's a very like, you know, it's not unlike here, by the way, this is not just like a, a Latin America, like we're, we clearly have a dissatisfied electorate. I, most people don't like both people running, right? I mean, th there's this, this sense, I think, in the hemisphere, and it's particularly acute in Latin America, like, please, I just want something different. Yeah, and like, I imagine a lot of it's, you know, to do with coming out of a fin financial crisis, followed by a pandemic, followed by a broader set of economic problems that have really clearly acutely hit Argentina. But yeah, I mean, like, outsiders, something radical change, you know, any, look, populism is at its essence, 
uh, someone telling you that, you know, real Americans are good and the elites are bad and we're on the side of the real people, you know, whatever country it might be. And this is exactly what he's doing here. Yeah. And I think the U.S. has to try to meet this moment in Latin America much more aggressively than we have. Um, we kind of go down there with our normal list of things like Venezuela and Cuba. You yeah. know. Uh, but, I, 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 you know, we had a role to play in Argenti- Argentina's fiscal crisis. You know, it's like a bunch of American hedge funds kind of, yeah. um, you know, swooped in and shorted the whole economy there and, and, and made a lot of money and put them in a lot of debt. I mean, th- I think there have to be new approaches to helping these leaders in Latin America climb out from these holes that they're in, some of which the U.S. helped dig the holes, you know, but mm-hmm. some of which we can also like lend a hand out. Yeah. And another hole is, is sort of uh, drug trafficking issues. So it yeah. gets us to Ecuador, uh, where an Ecuadorian presidential candidate named Fernando Villavicencio was murdered last week while leaving a campaign event in the capital. Uh, Ecuador's interior minister says all the six suspects are Colombian uh, and have been, and they have links to organized crime. Uh, the Via Vicencio was a vocal critic of gangs, drug traffickers, and, and talked openly about their links with government officials in Ecuador. He worked as a, a muckraking journalist. So he was a labor leader. He was a member of the National Assembly and sort of a general thorn in the side of the previous uh, socialist government. Uh, Via Vicencio had talked publicly about being threatened by gangs, including by a gang leader who was kind of running one of these gangs from a prison. The FBI is now going to assist in this investigation. Uh, his running mate, Andrew Ica, Gonzalez is going to run in his stead, and the election is going to continue as planned on August 20th. This is an especially tragic incident because for many years, Ecuador had been relatively safe, especially when compared to Colombia. But that has changed uh, in the last half decade or so as Colombian and Mexican drug cartels and gangs gained power in Ecuador. They joined forces with local prison and street gangs. Even there's gangs from the Balkans in there. Um, They all work together to export cocaine, I think, assume mostly to the United States. So, you know, I think a horrible situation here, but also uh, moments like this help explain leaders like Nayib Bukele, who you mentioned earlier in El Salvador, who's basically trampling on all human rights, throwing everybody in jail in the name of security and is polling at like 80 percent. Yeah, I mean, totally shocking. You can watch the video of this guy coming out of his campaign event and then he essentially gets gunned down. Uh, brazenly, um, people wanting to send a message that you know this, it, it, it's not safe to criticize the cozy relationship between certain political elites and these cartels, um, and yeah, shocking in that this is such a relatively new development in Ecuador. Um, a couple things here. First of the Colombian thing is interesting to me because you know you had. Uh, we covered the Haiti assassination. Mm-hmm. I think there were like over twenty Colombians involved yeah. in that. Um, Colombians were involved in some of the weird Mar-a-Lago planned coups in Venezuela you know, in the past. This is not to cast any aspersions on Colombians because I actually I love Colombia. I love Colombians. It's to say that as that civil conflict has you know wound down, you have former right wing paramilitaries, former left wing guerrillas. You've got cartels, yeah, like mercenaries the, for hire. Yeah, there, there seems yeah. to be quite a mercenary for hire yep. outfit um, that has been you know, implicated in a lot of this stuff. And so that that bears some scrutiny. Um, and then I also think it's like time, you know, we've also talked about the emerging Republican platform to like bomb Me- Mexico over fentanyl. Um, I think the conversation people want to have in Latin America is around different approaches to drug enforcement, including new approaches on legalization. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there ways to kind of bring some of this trafficking out of the shadows via legalization policies? Um, you know, there, one way to do it is to arrest everybody like Bukele. Another way is to kind of decriminalize certain things so that they're less uh, an illicit economy. Um, I don't know that the U.S. is ready to have the conversation, but I mean, it should be because the reality is this is not this. We're still what we're in like the fourth or fifth decade of the war on drugs. And we have people getting gunned down in Ecuador for this. Uh, and presumably most of the demand, i.e. the money that is financing this is U.S. demand for these drugs. This is, you know, this is our own um you know, inability to get our shit together, <laughs> spilling over borders. And I, I would hope that we can have a more rational conversation about drug policy across the hemisphere because this is going to keep happening in country after country otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And the, you're, you're right. The the conversation on the Republican side is entirely securitized. It's yeah. all about who can we kill. And, you know, talking to Ruben Gallego about this, he's running for Senate uh, in Arizona, former Marine, 
I relayed to him Ron DeSantis' comment about how, like, oh, you know, we managed to figure out who the bad guys were in Iraq, so we'll figure out who they are at the border. That's how we'll avoid killing civilians. And Ruben was like, no, we didn't. Yeah, you know, exactly. He was on patrols. Yeah. You know? yeah. So uh, we'll turn to Niger, Ben, um, where, you know, several weeks after this coup happened, uh, the coup leaders are still running the country. Uh, the presidential guard staged a coup against President Mohamed Bazoum on July 26th. They've had him under house arrest ever since with his family. Shortly after the coup, ECOWAS, the Union of, of West African States, gave the junta a deadline to return Bazoum to power or face potential military action. That deadline passed over a week ago now, and nothing has happened to resolve the crisis. So the coup leaders now say they plan to put President Bazoum on trial for treason, uh, and they say they won't hold talks with ECOWAS until ECOWAS acknowledges Niger's new leadership. The coup leaders named, uh, they appointed a civilian prime minister and I think a cabinet to implement policies. Ben, you're seeing lots of reports about rallies in support of the junta of the coup leaders. Those often include sightings of Russian flags. I think it's it's worth flagging. There's also reporting about how much disinformation is being spread around um, the region. There's like old videos of rallies in Burkina Faso and people are tagging them as being in, in Niger when they're not. Um, it's also true that anti-junta protests just get shut down by the security forces. But clearly these coup leaders um, have tapped into this powerful well of anti-French anti-colonial sentiment. Uh, last week, about a couple hundred people marched on France's military base in Niger, demanded that they leave. So, look, I, I don't know how you feel about this coup at this point. I'm not seeing a lot of experts who have any hope of, of it resolving soon or Bazoom being reinstated. Um, and I do think it's worth wondering whether there's really popular support to restore him into office or if this is you know, something that people are just like, you know what? We don't care what elites are in charge. We're just going to try to live our lives as best we can. Yeah, I think the latter is probably the point because I, I, I'm glad that you flagged this on the you know protests that you see on television. I mean, I, I really sincerely doubt th this was that this has like a groundswell of popular support because let's be clear about what happened here. There was like a, a, a presidential guard. So like a relatively small military force that was basically – tasked with protecting the, you know, almost like a secret service type enterprise, yep, exactly. right? Exactly. That seized power. <laughs> so these, this wasn't like a, a street leader, you know, this wasn't like somebody coming out of the this people. Wasn't Castro. This is like an yeah. older guy that was like, you know, about to get canned from his job and is like, actually, I don't want to get fired. I'm just going to take over the country and make a deal with these Wagner guys, put this guy in house arrest, you know, gin some people up to protest. You could probably pay some people to do that. Some people genuinely, yes, there's clearly genuinely anti-French, anti-colonial sentiment. And people just generally pissed off about the fact that, you know, the standards of living in Niger are among the lowest in the world, right? So these people have been getting a raw deal. And, they, you know, as we talked about last week, they've been getting a raw deal when you have countries, including the United States, giving hundreds of millions of dollars in security assistance and, like, life for these people doesn't get any better. Um, they're going to get frustrated with the status quo. Um, so on the one end, I... I, I you know, I'm not like an expert in Nigerian public opinion, but I, I would imagine that it's more apathy than anything else. Um, uh, what's clear is that the military didn't kind of come to the aid of the elected president. And and therefore, we're kind of exiting the window where you can have some quick resolution deal here for yep. some kind of power sharing. Or It feels like these people are pretty entrenched. It feels like ECOWAS is not going to go forward with its like threat to to go to war essentially over this. I think that what therefore is, needs to happen, and you see this in a lot of the analysis, is that people need to take a minute here you know, because we're now looking at a situation where the entire region across the Sahel, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, um, and, and all the way to Niger, Sudan. Yeah. all the way to Sudan, which is a bit different, but same thing, the guys with guns fighting out, like have totally rejected democracy. Uh, and that, that demands like a, a different approach than just insisting that, you know, there'd be another election, you know, like there, there has to be a different approach to how to support governance in these places um, and, and not just give these kind of dictates uh, that we think this guy should be in charge and you should have another election, you know, um, even though I'd prefer that happen. I mean, we just have to deal with the reality. Um, and so I, I would hope that there can be a conversation, you know, with other African leaders at the African Union, with ECOWAS about like, hey, what's a more sustainable approach here that is more responsive to publics that feel absolutely no investment in their own governments? Yeah. And it doesn't seem like, you know, Nigeria would probably have to lead the charge of any sort of ECOWAS intervention militarily. And it doesn't seem like there's popular support there. What seems likely in the sort of coup playbook is 
the junta announces a transitional government over some you know 18 yeah. months or whatever buys themselves a bunch of time where the world looks away and then just sort of maintains power in perpetuity yeah. it's worth mentioning ben uh we mentioned the sort of coup belt across the sahel which stretches all the way to sudan the Wall Street Journal reported that United Arab Emirates has been illicitly shipping weapons to the Sudanese warlord that is fighting the government in Sudan's ongoing civil war. It's a conflict that is reported. I think the UN reported that they have it has displaced four million people, including I think nearly a million across the border. So you know that's what our our closest allies are up to. Yeah, and let's let's be hell. yeah let's be clear about these like uh, you know uh, Abraham Accord participants in the Emirates, like they, they've been a big part of this coup trend. They financed the coup in Egypt, the restored, uh, or that not restored, that restored the military, but put uh, General Sisi in power. There's been a lot of reporting recently about General Sisi has basically completely destroyed the Egyptian economy by having these vanity projects. He's building a new capital in the desert, right? Yeah. That's their kind of guy, right? Then they're kind of arming warlords in Sudan who then end up fighting each other. You know, th- this, this, tolerance of Gulf money kind of washing around autocratic politics and sponsoring coups, if it's okay, and this is what Bobby's point was to me, if the U.S. is like, you know, okay with uh, some autocracy, in in his case, Uganda is what he was referring to, um, our credibility in the Niger situation is is not there. (laughs) And if, if we you know, continue to be, you know, close partners with the Emirates who everybody in that neighborhood knows sponsor coups and we continue to give military assistance to Egypt. Um, yeah, our, we're not like standing on pretty solid ground to say like, you better restore the democratically elected governing Niger. Yeah. And, and Max uh, Fisher pointed out that it's the 10 year anniversary uh, of, of Raba Square. Yeah. CC, yeah, massacring yeah. about a thousand protesters. Yeah. But, you know, we're most protesting. shameful days of the Obama administration because we didn't call it a coup, which yeah. is exactly what it was. Yeah. As, as is Niger. So, you know, the administration is clearly trying to buy as much time and space in terms of calling Niger a coup because they don't want it to cut off assistance, but we're heading that way. Um, ben. The other thing we love to do on this show is to bring everyone, the listeners, into the mind of the Republican primary electorate and some of the candidates and their foreign policy conversations. Uh, one of the more interesting political stories generally this cycle on the Republican side is why a candidate named Vivek Ramaswamy is doing so well. He's 38. He's a business guy. He looks like he's even younger. He has no relevant experience, but he's running as an outsider and he's gaining a lot of traction. Um I wanted to play a recent clip of Ramaswamy on Hugh Hewitt's podcast talking about how he would handle Chinese President Xi Jinping and a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. I think that his rush to do it before 2028 is going to change when I'm the U.S. president because I have now moved from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity. And I think that um, is best for the U.S. And I think that's that clear, actually helps us avoid war. What's clear to me is that you are saying I will go to war, including attacking the Chinese mainland if you attack before semiconductor independence, and afterwards you can have Taiwan. So if you just wait until 2029, you may have Taiwan. Is that clear? I mean, that's what you're saying. I'll go to war. Oh, Hugh, I'm running to be 20- the next president, and so I expect to be the president inaugurated on January 20th, 2025. So I'm wearing that hat when I'm choosing my words very carefully right now. And I'm being very clear. Xi Jinping should not mess with Taiwan until we have achieved semiconductor independence, until the end of my first term, when I will lead us there. And after that, our commitments to Taiwan and our commitments to be willing to go to military conflict will change after that because that's rationally in our self-interest. So he's basically saying, if I'm president, Taiwan's got four years and then it's getting invaded. That's his plan. (laughs) That's fucking crazy. Um, Yeah. it's like gobsmackingly nuts, right? Uh, because he's basically, he's making all kinds of mistakes there. You know, like, like you know, he's giving a security guarantee to Taiwan, including we'll go bomb the Chinese mainland. And then saying, but like, you know, the Chinese military modernization that will allow them to be ready to attack Taiwan, most experts say is 2027. So he's been saying the Chinese like, wait one year. Yeah. And first of all, like, Everything about this is so dumb, too. I, I've never seen anything that suggests that we can achieve total independence from advanced semiconductors manufactured in Taiwan by 2028 either. Nor have I. Like, I don't think there, that, that's Even not, with the CHIPS Act. That's physically impossible, too. So everything about that is insane, dressed up as if he, he's saying something smart. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And he has that kind of all in podcasting where it's like, I've been successful in one thing in life. So Watch me logic this problem. They, yeah. Therefore, yeah. I, I'm qualified to, to opine on this. Here's a, the serious point I make that we should watch and we should keep coming back to. The U.S. position on Taiwan is all over the map. This is the most, this should get more attention. Like, this is the most dangerous hotspot in the world other than Ukraine for a potential really global conflict between nuclear armed countries, the United States and China. Everybody agrees that that, that may happen. Um, and, you know, Joe Biden has said publicly that he would come to Taiwan's defense. His administration says that's not the case. We've walked, we, we, we walked it back. Like four times. Then Donald Trump alternates between saying he doesn't give a shit about Taiwan and they stole the semiconductors yeah. from us. <laughs> then the conventional Republicans, the hawkish Republicans, are kind of, you know, want to like, rec- you know, Mike Pompeo has called for like recognizing Taiwan as an independent country. And, and shoving weapons. And now we've country, got this yeah. new position that we're going to give a temporary security guarantee until we can get the semiconductors. And then, so this is the most important potential issue in the world uh, in terms of national security and geopolitics over the next five years to 10 years. And in, to be honest, kind of both parties, I don't think we could say exactly what the U.S. position is. And the Democrats are much more coherent. Like there's none of these kind of crackpot proposals as in the Republican side. But this needs to be drawn out a bit. We also have a Taiwanese election in January that is likely to elect a, you know, someone who's been generally pro-independence, although he's significantly moderated his position, uh, William Lai, in the campaign. This, you know, this is needs a little more scrutiny. If you're sitting in Taiwan, you're probably a little confused about what's going on. And so um, my yeah. theory of the case on Vivek here is he's giving, generally speaking, he's like a sort of high energy, like optimistic dude to the point of rapping way too often. But he's sort of he's giving like a sunnier version of MAGA. But he's also like we listened to that uh, the the comment he made last week about intelligence around 9-11 and connections to Saudi intelligence and the government. But they also basically like, I don't trust government at all. He's tapping into the distrust vein, like the Joe Rogan vein of the Republican Party, but also the isolationism vein. And, and I think this here, this answer is basically like, I will do isolationism in a more extreme, but like 4D chess way where I dress it up with this sort of bullshit semiconductor theory of the case that I'll do in my first term. And then I promise you that we're never going to go to war with China. Yeah, it, it is very Trumpy too, that only thing he cares about is like a very narrow economic interest. Now it's an important one in advanced semiconductors. But to your point, like people in Taiwan, who I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for, I wrote a long article about this for The Atlantic, if people want to check that out, if you haven't, like, they must be looking at this like, what, uh, like, <laughs> our survival depends in part on the United States and how they play this. Um, both because the United States could either help provoke a conflict or the United States could help prevent one or yeah. the United States could come to our aid. And if you're them looking at us, you know, you, you have a pretty good handle on a Biden at least. But like, if you look across the political spectrum, you, you have no idea w- what the U.S. position is on this. The Chinese, same thing. Yeah, they're, uh, they're watching this stuff. They're closely. watching this stuff too and thinking, like, well, you know, I, I, it's hard for us to take seriously anything that, that certainly the Republicans say about this issue. And, and Hugh Hewitt, it's funny. Hugh is as incredulous and confused as we are, but just from an entirely different perspective. He's like, you basically just drew an Obama-style red line to defend Taiwan, but then you're hanging them out to dry. But Ben, um, I just want to play one more clip from Vivek in this interview that I think helps explain the whole thing. I want to be crystal clear. I will be the president who keeps us out of world war. Has said that before, I'll say it again. If there's one presidential candidate who has the depth, I mean, nobody's gone into remotely this level of detail here. It's like not even close where the rest of the Republican field is. And, and, and you know, here's a funny little fact. Also, let's just call this spade a spade. I didn't know much of this six months ago, but the only difference between me and the other candidates is I'm the only one actually willing to admit that. I think many of them still don't know it now. And so I think this depth of understanding combined with strategic clarity actually is what will keep us out of war. That is the most tech guy mentality in the world. (laughs) I spent six months studying foreign policy and memorizing some things and therefore trust me to solve the world's problems that keep us out of all wars. It's just like, it's just unbelievable hubris. It's just, I love also the verbal text of, let me be crystal Let clear. Be clear. Let me call a spade a spade. Like, if you just say things like that, then it lends some credibility to what you're going to say next. I love Hugh Hewitt, like, pouncing in, like, I agree. You know, this is a guy who beat the fuck out of me, like, for eight years because he said I had no experience, even though I'd had, like, six years in national security before I went to work for Obama. 
he, this guy's talking about like boning up on this in six months. And he's like, oh, <laughs> I president. You should be president. Like, this is insane. It's totally it's insane. Truly this is incredible. The, the, the complete amateurization of presidential politics yeah. in the Republican Party that Trump has facilitated is, is, is wild to behold. Truly. And this guy is polling in second place in some polls. So, you know, to, lest we, we should not look past these people. Um, so, Ben, speaking with China, uh, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, one thing President Biden loves to do in mostly in fundraisers is talk shit about the Chinese <laughs> yeah, government. Just, just fucking throw shade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so he called uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping a dictator, one in, in California. And then last week, he said that high unemployment in China's aging workforce is a ticking time bomb at the heart of the global economy. Now, like that might, I'm sure that didn't, the Chinese probably didn't love that, but Biden is not at all wrong here. Uh, China recently decided to stop reporting its youth unemployment rate because the number had gotten so high. It was 21.3% in June. They've also restricted uh, access to other economic data. The Chinese central bank cut interest rates recently. There's a Chinese real estate developer, I think the biggest in the country, that recently failed to pay its bondholders and warned they would post a record loss for the first six months of the year. You're hearing more and more analysis saying, that this Chinese real estate bubble was in part totally fake demand, like real estate developers getting paid to build stuff that's now getting torn down because no one ever wanted to live in it. Um, so, you know, that's the, what Biden's getting at. But the other part of Biden's comment about China's economy was, quote, when bad folks have problems, they do bad things, which I think essentially raises the question, do China's economic problems make it less likely for Xi Jinping to make a move on Taiwan? Or does it make it more likely because someone like she knows intuitively that like whipping up militaristic nationalism is a tried and true method to manage, you know, economic discontent among its people? Do you have a theory of the case here? It seems like Biden certainly seems to think it, it could be more likely. So first of all, like, I, I, I don't know this to be true at all, but it does kind of feel like Joe Biden shares some of his briefings at these events, yeah. you know, <laughs> like because like it seemed like he recently got a briefing on the Chinese economy. Yeah, Kirk Campbell said something. Yeah, interesting, yeah, yeah. And uh, but like I, I like and it's it's an interesting choice to call. G, he's like, make no mistake, he's calling Xi Jinping bad people there, mm -hmm. um, which Xi Jinping will certainly hear. Um, and not love. So once again, he's kind of you know he seems to because he used to talk about how much he loves Xi Jinping and he went to yeah, they're boys that hung they're, out. They're boys. Something bad happened, I guess, along the way. Yeah. Um, I'm more inclined to agree with Biden's analysis. So the Xi Jinping, you know, he's not as as kind of uh, overtly, obviously odious as as Vladimir Putin is with his nationalism. But like Xi Jinping has methodically cultivated a, a cult of personality and a more hardline nationalism and the so-called kind of wolf war diplomacy. Like he 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 doesn't soften like he seems to only move in one direction which is like a harder line direction and absolutely i think if he felt like the thing was coming apart um economically you know he's amassed enough strength to make maybe a move on a taiwan and to change the conversation in terms of domestic politics and geopolitics i think these economic issues are very real the the irony of it is that china benefited from kind of this unfettered globalization for forever but then when they started kind of cracking down and reverting back to a marxist leninist approach where the state controlled the economy they're chasing out you know foreign businesses they're like making it harder to engage in private enterprise locking up tech guys locking up tech guys not saying i'm some uber capitalist but like the reality is capital is going to look at that and say like eh, maybe, yeah, maybe we're we'll, yep. we'll invest in vietnam, vietnam or mexico yeah. or you know india um and so that at the same time that all this new wealth that got created well, guess what happened? Some of it disappeared into the hands of corrupt people. Some of it went into kind of ghost real estate. And look, a lot of these countries that have rapid growth and in industrialization, I'm not like an economic historian here, but there's usually a crash at some point. You know, like that's happened in this country multiple times, right? Um, and if they have a crash and it's a very big country and they've got mass youth, youth unemployment, there are ingredients for at least localized unrest in different places. So this is this is a real thing. And and again, Biden sharing it suggests to me that like given his lack of filter, that maybe that's what's in his briefing. You yeah, know? you're probably right. You're probably hearing that you know she's going to do whatever it takes to avoid another Tiananmen Square. Um, I think it was the New York Times Magazine had a big piece over the weekend about. Biden's export controls and yes. how the they're, it's really hurting China's ability to do AI work. Oh, yeah. So an FT report, the Chinese internet companies are scrambling to buy $5 billion worth of NVIDIA chips. That's the These are these like um, video gaming chips that have proven incredibly useful for AI processing. It just sort of shows how these export controls well, are really working. Yeah. So they, they just announced another round of this recently that got at like investment restrictions. Mm -hmm. So not just like technological inputs, but 
the, make no mistake, like the one of the most important foreign policies of the Biden administration that doesn't get that much attention is this web of export controls that are basically meant to choke off China's capacity to build, you know, a, a, an AI base uh, and to compete with us in certain, you know, quantum mechanics and other areas. And this is beginning to, I think, scare off not just investment in those sectors, but it's beginning to scare off other investment in China hmm. because, like, Western firms are looking at that and they're thinking, well, how far are these export controls and sanctions going to go? And so you start to get into a place where you're impacting investments even beyond what you're putting in restriction. And so, you know, I think the U.S. policy is contributing to this squeeze that the Chinese economy is under. Yeah, no doubt. Um, staying in sort of Asia, the President Biden's hosting the presidents of Japan and South Korea at Camp David on Friday. According to the Associated Press, they're expected to announce plans for more military cooperation, especially dealing with ballistic missiles from North Korea. This comes as North Korea has announced more production of weapons. They're reportedly selling uh, shells to the Russians. Uh, and there's, you know, the sort of broader mu mood music is just China messing with everybody in the region. And building bases out of sandbars. Um, Biden is hosting uh, a group lunch. There's one-on-one -on -one talks with each of them. There's other events, God only knows. Uh, we talked in previous episodes about some of the thawing between South Korea and Japan that dates back to Japan's uh, brutal colonial rule of the Korean Peninsula from 1910 to 1945. But you know, this, this is one of those kind of wonky, nerdy events that uh, is a big deal, you know, it's kind of historic in nature, but I'm curious like what you think might come out of this. I think it's a, a really impressive uh, act of diplomacy by the Biden administration because, uh, you know, in the Obama years, the South Koreans and the Japanese were locked in these fights over history. And we had to work really hard to broker just like trilateral meetings um, at neutral venues, you know, like, um, and that that's continued to be the case uh, since then. And, you know, for them to put aside that depth of historical grievance and nationalism and antipathy and come all the way to Camp David for this kind of summit, I think is a sign of uh, like a, it's not fully repaired, but uh, that the U.S. has kind of steadied this relationship between its two most important allies in, in Northeast Asia. So that, that, um, you know, just the fact of the meeting is important. Now, I think it's also like a part of their strategy in Asia to make sure that our alliances are functioning not just you know individually with us, but uh, you know with each other. You know, and so you know it'll be interesting to see what comes out of this on North Korea. <clears throat> Frankly, I think like you, I don't have a lot of hope that that's going to change for the better. Um, but you still want to be aligned with these folks. Um, but also, like, are they on the same page on China, w on things like export controls, on things like Taiwan, uh, on the war in Ukraine, where we've kind of prodded them to do more, particularly South Koreans. So, you know, we'll see what comes out of it. We'll also see, like, how strong the political standing of these leaders is, because, and this is beyond the control of the Biden administration to some extent, but, like, neither of these guys are that well positioned at home right now. Um, and so... They they're taking some risk. Yeah, in, hard in to doing make concessions. Yeah. yeah, so so that I'll be watching that too. But it, you know, this is a you know it's a positive step, and it's a good use of Camp David. I mean, um, I wish we you know we used it for a G seven and some other things. It, it is really good to get up there, and you know you're kind of off grid. With yeah, it's cool guys. and yeah. special, and yeah. makes the leaders feel like yeah. you know it's a big deal back home. Yeah, I think it's good. Uh, sort of a hodgepodge of updates from of Russia and Ukraine. So. Uh, military experts now believe that Ukrainian troops involved in the counteroffensive are making what they're describing as tactically significant progress. That translates to about like 10 or 12 miles of territorial gains, but ones that are forcing the Russians to redeploy from other places on the front lines and maybe weaken their defenses. Uh, the Ukrainians have a long way to go to meet their ultimate goal of getting to the Sea of Azov and cutting off Russia's land bridge to Crimea or other supply lines. And the Russians are counterattacking and they're firing cruise missiles at cities across Ukraine, but it, it's limited progress. Uh, and Russia itself, the U.S. ambassador to Russia met with Evan Gershkovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter, being held by Russian authorities. It was their third meeting. Uh, the Russian central bank was forced to raise interest rates by 3.5 points the most since the war started. They're dealing with rising prices and a weakening economy. We also, last week, I think we talked about the Black Sea and uh, sea drones taking out Russian boats. Uh, on Sunday, the Russian military intercepted, you know, fired warning shots at and then boarded a commercial ship. It was uh, flying the flag of Palau, owned by a Turkish company, but it seems like things are ramping up further there. And then we saw that the Poland is deploying more troops to the border with Belarus raising tensions uh, about the risk of a direct NATO conflict there. 
And uh, I imagine, you know, Poland's not thrilled about the Wagner Group setting up shop right across the border. And they are also, you know, the, the, the broader concern, I think, for NATO is Poland has that key land border that connects them with the Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, other more isolated uh, NATO allies. Yeah. I mean, all those updates kind of illuminate some of the trends we've been talking about, like slow gains on the counteroffensive, but still moving forward. It's just a great cost. Um, the Black Sea is this kind of tinderbox and, and a little too close for comfort military activity between uh, you know, NATO's borders and Russia. I, I think the other thing that jumped out, you know, I was saying you, Tommy, is like also the Russian economy um, seemingly taking a bit of a hit here. They raised interest rates. They like jacked those up because the ruble is like, you know, collapsing, collapsing basically. Yeah. And, and the reason it's collapsing is because all these Russian companies are like borrowing to basically pay for the war effort and their munitions production. So, you know, Russia's domestic economy is now a uh, part of this. It's totally propped up by the war. It it's propped like. up yeah. by the war and borrowing. And so there's just a lot of volatility right now. And it's not, you know, it's not particularly going well for anybody, not the Ukrainians, not the, obviously not the Russians. Um, but it, it feels like one of these pots is going to boil over, you know, yeah. um, something in the Black Sea, something between Russia and NATO, something internal to Russia. Maybe the Ukrainians kind of find one opening that they can push through. You know, there's a momentum here that has been stuck in a lot of places while tensions have been building. And I would be surprised if, you know, by the fall, we're not talking about a pretty dramatic set of circumstances in at least one of these areas we've been circling around. Yeah. And, and sort of more broadly, I mean, you flagged some polling out of Europe that shows that people don't necessarily blame the Russians for the war. A lot of them blame the U.S. Uh, the Times had an interesting piece about Sweden's efforts to combat Russian disinformation about the war. They're getting much more aggressive. Uh, and then, Ben, I saw you know Russia, I think, pulled together a meeting to try to uh, message to diplomats from sort of the non-Western world. And I read this quote from the head of Russia's foreign intelligence agency, the SVR, um, that was amazing. He said, quote, this is a speech to you know this, this summit. Uh, Man is created in the image and likeness of God, but Westerners seek to replace him with all sorts of transgender people and biomechanoids. Indeed, for a physically and spiritually healthy person, it's unpleasant and sometimes even scary to arrive in Europe, given how many different kinds of perversions have bred there. So these like Russian fucking, you know, bloodthirsty intel goons are essentially using rhetoric that you might hear uh, on a Tucker Carlson show or in the Republican primary. Oh, yeah. They're like all in on the, you know, anti-cancel. Like Kanye could basically take Dimitri yeah. Medvedev's job over there, you know. Uh, guy, Fuentes or whatever. Uh, or Fuentes Fuentes or one of the, or, you know, Tucker obviously is, could be like their lead broadcaster. Um, th that that data also like came from uh, like the Navalny operation. Um, they were preparing for these uh, protests that they're trying to mobilize across Europe on August 20th um, against Putin. Um, so people want to get out, you know, protest Putin. That's a pretty easy thing to protest against. Um, but yeah, like, I, you know, we should be watching the U.S. If you're Putin, you're watching the U.S. election, the French election, some of these elections that are coming up the next couple of years as as maybe your your escape hatch here. Yeah. Last story here. Um, <clears throat> Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen recently visited China for some <laughs> meetings. Uh, she went to a restaurant with a big group that uh, the restaurant is a chain. It translates to in and out. No relation to the to the overrated burgers here. Um, some other diners noticed Yellen ordered a dish that includes a mushroom uh, whose name roughly translates to sea hand blue. That is apparently because if you push on it, the inner surface, it turns blue when you squeeze it, but it also could have to do with the fact that it can make you trip balls. Uh, a botany professor told CNN that his friend mistakenly took these mushrooms and uh, hallucinated for three days. Whoa. That, uh, I don't know. I don't care what festival you're at. That's that yeah, that's like, like that's time. Burning Man style there. Yeah. yeah. So here's uh, Janet Yellen describing her experience to CNN's Aaron Brennan. May I ask you, I'm, I'm just quite curious, Apparently so. what was it like, the mushroom experience? <laughs> so I, I went with this large group of people, and the person um, who had arranged our dinner did the ordering. Uh, there was a delicious mushroom dish. I was not aware that uh, these mushrooms had hallucinogenic uh, properties. I learned that later. I can tell you later, like in your when you were, were sleeping and having visions, or <laughs> <laughs> I I was 
read that if the mushrooms are cooked properly, which I'm sure they were at this very good restaurant, that they have no impact. So I think we all probably can agree that tripping your face off during like <laughs> several days of meetings with Chinese officials <laughs> wouldn't be the best. But Biden and Xi wandering uh, around the woods of Camp David, yeah, having a little talking talk. to some trees. Yeah, talking about life. Uh, I feel like that could, talking about their goals. Um, uh, that could be Jenny what the doctor Yellen, ordered. Yeah, uh, so many things funny about that, including that Jenny Yellen is not the cabinet member I would think be most likely to be tripping balls on mushrooms, you know? Um, but uh, I also think that uh, she said, if you listen carefully, and she's laughing a lot, like she had a good experience, she suffered no ill effects. Right. Yeah. She didn't say effects. That's a good right? point. You know I mean, like maybe it was just a good trip um, and she came out with a little more clarity and maybe like, you know, a, a little more, uh, you know, she saw like the financial markets from a new perspective, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she, um, yeah, connected with some people in ways she didn't expect. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be funny if the Chinese did steer visiting foreign dignitaries to places where they just got completely bonkers on mushrooms. And you just had the yeah. time of your life. Yeah. Like a little ayahuasca. Yeah, really good. Yeah, a little ayah ceremony in, uh, in, in, in China. Listen, I think listeners probably know this is a drug positive podcast, but I, <laughs> I genuinely don't think it's the worst idea. <laughs> It's actually not. I mean, the, like on occasion. Imagine if there's just one G20 where everybody agreed to yes. do mushrooms. Yes. And, and it was like no judgments, right? Like you know, like you're you're with you like we're we're in a judgment free zone here in the G20. Yeah. Putin's crying. He's yeah. pulling up that woman. Yeah, Remember yeah, the yeah. lady who said, "I wish I was yeah, your mother." It's just, it's just, you know, you get 24 hours. And we're gonna seal off the space. We're gonna maybe you be you can get take walks and get some air, but like judgment free. Take some mushrooms and see what you come out of it. I, I guarantee you that. It's more likely to resolve things and to lead to more wars. Yeah, you could, you know, Biden could probably book some pretty good bands. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You maybe could get the dead out there. Yeah, some, yeah, yeah. You know, we get maybe dance John Mayer music. go out with the dead one more time. You know? Yeah, yeah. Dust off uh, Bobby and Mickey and get them back. Bobby, out there. you know, they're still alive, I, Bobby right? could kind of run the G twenty. Basically, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you should get out there. Okay. Well, listen. I, I know we have some government listeners, so. Get back to think us about on it, whether guys. we can make think this happen. Think about it, guys. Let's make it up. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. and When we come back, you'll hear Ben's interview with Bobby Wine. So stick around for that. Support for Pod Save the World comes from Wise, the account that lets you send, spend, and receive money internationally. Wise is the best way to move and manage your money around the world all with one account. With Wise, you can save in more than 40 currencies, giving you more bang for your bot, peso, and pound. So you can send money back home fast or spend seamlessly in the local currency while on your travels abroad business or pleasure. You can shop online from overseas while avoiding inflated transaction fees as well, or receive your paycheck in another currency. You'll always get the mid-market exchange rate when you convert between currencies with no markups, no hidden fees, whatever's on the horizon, it's one account built for your international life. Join 15 million people and businesses already saving and see what Wise could do for you by downloading the app or visiting wise.com slash crooked world. That's wise.com slash crooked world. Positive the World is brought to you by ZBiotics. Uh, listen, listen, the older you get, the more you realize that, uh, even if you have one drink or two, you might feel it the next day. You're probably going to feel it the next day and rough mornings. No bueno. I think we both fucked up quite recently <laughs> as you record this, as you record this ad, we both thought to ourselves, oh, we should have had Z-Biotics. Yeah, let me tell you a little bit. I did have a Z-Biotics last night. Oh. oh, it helps me so much. <laughs> so stupid. We both went to a concert. We had a couple cocktails and uh, Z-Biotics, man. Every time it makes me feel so much better. Z-Biotics is a pre-alcohol probiotic. It's the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It is designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. I swear by Z-Biotics. Give it a try. Go to zbiotics.com slash PSTW to get 15% off your first order when you use PSTW at checkout. That's zbiotics.com slash PSTW and use the code PSTW at checkout for 15% off. I'm very happy to welcome back to Pod Save the World, uh, Bobby Wine. Uh, Bobby is here with his wife, Barbie, as well. Um, they're here because uh, there's an extraordinary documentary that uh, people should check out uh, called Bobby Wine, the People's President. It's currently in theaters in L.A., New York, coming in San Francisco, Boston, hopefully others. Uh, and it'll be streaming uh, this fall on National Geographic Disney+. Plus. Uh, for those who don't know, Bobby is a Ugandan singer and political leader uh, who leads his party, the National Unity Platform, uh, very courageously uh, ran for president uh, in the last Ugandan election against the 
longstanding autocratic leader, uh, President Museveni. Uh, Barbie is a, a writer in, in her own right um, and uh, worth checking out her work um, and has uh, obviously been along for this entire political journey. So uh, welcome, guys, to, to Los Angeles. So glad you could be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. So uh, I, I want to start with a question um, that for both of you, really, um, which is how, how you make this decision to get into politics, Bobby. You have a successful career uh, as, a, as a singer, as a performer, as an actor. Um, you, you know the risks, I imagine, of taking on someone like Museveni. Um, what, what drew you into politics? What, what got you on this journey? It's true that I had a successful career and a relatively comfortable life, but it's just um, this one time that I was awakened uh, to realize that regardless of how comfortable I was, if everybody else is uncomfortable, my comfort, uh, my comfort was an illusion. And uh, that's why I rose to the occasion to fix it for everybody else. Otherwise, um, it was illusion. It's still illusion to think that uh, you one is all right when it's surrounded by sheer poverty. And Barry, what about you? I mean, you you had to know uh, what was in. I mean, maybe not everything that that was uh, going to happen, but uh, you had to know this is going to be a tough uh, a tough journey. Uh, what was your thoughts? Yeah, on twenty seventh August two thousand eleven, I gave my vows to stand by his side for better for worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not like the main reason, but I had had also my personal experiences. I work with a charity which I started with friends 10 years ago. It's called Caring Hearts Uganda. And I had had this rare chance to traverse the country and go to all the rural places. So I didn't like the roads I went through. I didn't like to see the poverty that I was seeing. Even when we were helping with keeping the girl child in school, through menstrual health and menstrual hygiene, it was not helping because we needed the government to do something bigger than yeah. just an NGO can do. So when he said he was going to run for MP, yeah. I said maybe that's the beginning of legislation. He would make changes. The government had promised that they would give free sanitary pads to the girls in schools and that had not come yet. So I said, why not go there, add on the voices of the many who want to do better for the country. So it was for the best that I would just support him to go and do that. So the film shows, you know, I think your marriage comes across powerfully, um, the, 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 the partnership that you bring to this. It also shows uh, the reaction that you get uh, when you're campaigning. You know, you, you, you run for parliament, then you run for president. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Bobby, like the, you know, People don't see or understand, I think, what the concerns are and the aspirations are of of the kind of people you are inspiring, the young people in Uganda. Um, even if people travel through Kampala, you know, they, they don't get out and really see what's on the minds of uh, a particularly younger people in, in what is the youngest, uh, you, you know, certainly the youngest region in the world. Um, what? How would you describe who you were connecting with and what they wanted from the government? Thank you very much. Uh, Uganda is a country of 45 million people. The majority of them are young people. Actually, to be precise, 85% of the population in Uganda is under the age of 35. Uganda is the second youngest country in the world. You know, very blessed naturally, natural resources with oil, with uh, gold, uh, and uh, all manner of, uh, of natural resources, including a good climate. So it has a lot of potential. Now, on the other side, Uganda is ruled by General Yoweri Museveni, who took power in 1986, mm -hmm. that is 37 years ago, promising a new day for Uganda. But up to today, 80% of the, those young people are unemployed and are living below the poverty line. Uh, there's gross violation of human rights um, and the rule of law and uh, persecution for anybody that raises a voice. So it is that population that I am appealing to, to take charge of their destiny and ensure that those that, that rule over us use the natural resources of the country to transform healthcare, to transform education, to transform infrastructure, because we are faced with a, a mortality rate of 20 women dying every day while giving birth, of 300 
children under the age of five dying on a daily basis. Um, we are faced with an education system that is failing, a healthcare system that is failing where the, those that, the, that are in government actually seek healthcare ab outside the country. So we are a population trying to transform that, to change that because it's, it's possible. However, those con people are also concerned that that government is being aided by the international community, especially the United States, which gives General Museveni to the tune of a billion dollars every year in terms of security cooperation. We appreciate that, but the people of Uganda are saying the United States should review that and make sure that the support they give in Uganda is not a problem to Uganda, but a blessing by putting conditions to that. So all those aspirations are what I represent and are trying to give a face and to communicate to the world. And, and just for people, you know, who may not be entirely familiar with the story, uh, d describe the, the kinds of um, intimidation, detention, abuse. Like, what was the experience of running for president as an opposition figure in Museveni's Uganda like? Thank you. Um, it is not only running for president that is problematic, but any voice that dares to challenge uh, the status quo or to call for reforms in Uganda faces it rough, including actors, journalists, musicians, religious leaders, and any citizen. Uh, many of them have had to run to exile, many of them are, are in prison, and many of them have been killed. But however, me, I went a step higher to challenge General Museveni for the presidency. For 37 years, there has been a facade of democracy because this is what tyrants do. They put sham elections to paint a good picture in the Western world that it is all well. Now, when I showed up, the young people massively followed me because I was a pop star, I'm a musician, I'm very popular, and I speak slang like the masses of the people. So I tell them, yo, guys, we can actually change this. And when I showed them, they saw it's possible. Now, this threatened General Seven so much that he unleashed untold terror on the people of Uganda. Today, as we speak, they are abductions, state-sanctioned abductions and extrajudicial killings going on every day, the gross human rights violations. Now, in the film, you will see, uh, you know, gross human rights violations, but that's not even 10% of what actually happens. You know, um, there are hundreds of political prisoners today because General Museveni feels so threatened by the real eminent threat of change and end of his military regime. So, Bar Barbie, what is that like when B Bobby is, you know, he's tortured at points, uh, obviously uh, ends up under house arrest after what was widely perceived as a fraudulent uh, election? I mean, how, how do you find the resilience to, uh, to get through that while still trying to um, inspire and motivate, uh, you know, you're dealing with your family, uh, in your own circumstances, and you're also still, you know, uh, obviously a symbol of importance to people across the country. How did you, how did you deal with that? I mean, how do you find the resilience to get through that? It's really very tough. First of all, it is hard because when he's under house arrest, I am under house arrest. Yeah. And then out there, they are unleashing terror on our people. They are arresting them, they are killing them on the streets and I am helpless because I can't be out there to contribute on helping with the court sessions to have them release or to like um, locate them and know which prisons they're in or to go to the families, like talk to their parents and talk to their wives and talk to their children. It is more helpless to be under house arrest than to actually be in prison because you know, you are watching what's happening outside the fence and it it's more painful because the people you'd want to run to rescue are there with no one to go to, to, go to them and help them. But how, how do we find the strength? Personally, how do I find the strength? I know that I am not alone. 
I know that there are other several women out there fighting for the freedom of their husbands and their sons. And I get stronger because I know I am not alone. I know that we are fighting as a group and we are fighting as mothers of the nation. And I pray. I pray to God and ask for strength. And then I have groups of friends, girlfriends who pray with me, who talk to me, who meet me, who help me with the children when I'm overwhelmed. I have a large family. My parents are both alive. I have siblings. I have a lot of support. But the harder part is knowing what is happening to the more helpless families um, of those who are part of the struggle, where I am supposed to be helping, like, give them morale and strength and energy to go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you, you know, Bobby, despite all this, you, you know, you, you still motivate an enormous vote share. There's clearly a lot of indications of fraud. Um, you endure house arrest. Now you're uh, traveling. Um, what's next? I mean, what what are you, you know, General Museveni is very old. Um, he has a kind of uh, sociopathic son that he seems to be grooming for potential succession. This is a guy that likes to threaten to invade, you know, Kenya on, on Twitter. Um, but what's next for you and your party and, and for Ugandan politics? Um, it's a, a big question. Uh, I would say I don't know, but I will not say that. I'll say not giving up. Not giving up is the only way forward. Right now, as we speak, General Museveni is in Russia with his son, you know, and a few other, you know, dictators from Africa, uh, those that have just taken over power, uh, undermining democracy and, uh, you know, asserting themselves that shows that the anti-democracy forces are solidly working together and enforcing each other and helping each other and looking out for each other. Um, he's tightening his uh, relations with uh, um, the East and all that. But, you know, we also continue in Uganda to sensitize the people and to tell people not to give up. But even if we continue to give people hope, even if the people continue to ask us to continuously challenge Museveni uh, in elections, even if we know that he controls all the systems, we refuse to give up. And that's why I come to the international community uh, to make sure I try to make my voice and the voice of the people of Uganda heard by those that make decisions here in America to ask them to stop sponsoring our oppression. We can defeat Museveni because we defeated him in an election and, and uh, if uh, America was to stand by the democratic values that it represents as the world's greatest democracy and say we are not going to work with you Museveni because you abuse democracy, Museveni would still would be no more because the people of Uganda would be able to protest publicly but I mean every time we protest People get massacred on the street. Much as we get, uh, you know, voices of condemnation, we don't get enough action. Now, we are hoping to get action. We petitioned the International Criminal Court, and we hope this time the International Criminal Court holds Museveni on the same standard as all other dictators. You know, if that happens, if we, he gets sanctioned like some of his generals have been sanctioned, but we want Museveni, the overall person and his son, those are the people that cast, uh, that unleash the untold, you know, uh, torture on the people of Uganda. If they're sanctioned, then they will think twice before they massacre people. Our demand is a free and fair election. That is all we want. And we want the international community to help us achieve that. If we get a free and fair election, that will be the end of tyranny in Uganda. And if you you would like the U.S. therefore to kind of c condition any assistance around a free and fair election, uh, yes. you know, no more blank check for yes. seventy, I imagine. Yes, right? yeah. yes. Um, what do you, you, you know, is a different part of Africa, obviously, um, and, and we always have to remember the the diversity of the continent. But it, we've seen this string of military coups, and you know, Niger most recently. 
Um, and now we see this kind of risk of a potential almost conflict between the the countries in West Africa that have had recent coups and and yeah. the rest of ECOWAS. I mean, wh- wh- how how should we think about that? I mean, do do you see a trend that is uh, a, a, across the continent, or are these d- different situations in different regions of of, of the continent? It's it's very unfortunate what's happening. Um, very very unfortunate. We are all re- Africa is responsible, but the West is also responsible. You know. Um, it's a great threat to democracy. You know, when a coup is tolerated in one country, when military dictatorship is tolerated in one country, it's a clear communication to those that seek to to establish dictatorships elsewhere that it's actually possible and acceptable. And uh, that is why we've always been asking for conditional, you know, uh, aid or relationship. General Museveni is the master of violence in the Great Lakes region of Africa, and that's the inspiration that he gives. That's why we have prop-up dictatorships in Sudan and many other countries, you know, because they see that it's actually acceptable. But if the West puts his foot down and said, we are not going to deal with the dictator- with dictatorships, I can guarantee you that... Uh, dictatorships will in many ways be averted. Yes, now um, uh, uh, you see that many of them are trying to match their way to the Russian uh, uh, side because less uh, demand yeah. uh, is there from that side for democratic values. But I insist that at the end of the day, uh, democracy wins. So let us make it win. It will not win as a miracle. It will take decisions and efforts. And and Barbara, you're traveling uh, now. You, you know, people obviously see this movie outside of Uganda. I mean, what what do you want people to to think and do? How do you want people to to respond to your story that's in this film and that you'll be talking about as you're traveling around? First, what I want them to see, I want them to see, uh, besides the oppression and uh, brutality, I want people to see the hope, the hope uh, in the young people of Uganda who have refused to resign, uh, who have refused to give up uh, the aspirations for a better Uganda, not only change, but change of policies and change of direction and uh, reallocating our priorities, you know. Um, How do we want the world to respond? First, we want the world to give us its attention, you know, and we want world leaders to hold uh, the government of Uganda, this one and all those that will come after, to the same standards, to the same standards. Um, And I always say it that uh, if what is happening in Uganda was happening in any European country, I'm sure it would be alarming. I went to Ukraine uh, in the height of the war, and I visited Butcher. I saw the mass murders there. It was alarming. Yes, it made it world news. But the same thing is happening on a regular basis in Uganda, the same country that is a U.S. ally. So we want the world to help us elevate our voices. We know that uh, leaders listen to their people. If When it's treated by me, a Ugandan, you know, it usually doesn't get the same weight as when it's treated by an American. We cannot come and and start protesting in a country that is not ours. The few Ugandans that are here are actually better off not causing any trouble or any loud voice because they are here on probation. They, they left trouble in Uganda and they are even lucky to be here. So they don't get the confidence to come and protest. But we're asking you, the American brothers and sisters, to also mind us... Um, um, and I've communicated this to also the black community here. You know, uh, we've seen them speak out loud. They should also say African lives matter so that we don't get massacred while the world watches. For us, that is enough for us to have our case followed up and our voices elevated. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Barbie, what's the experience like of seeing your life you know, uh, revealed to the world like this. So the the film has both, 
you know, political moments, but also personal ones. I mean, uh, what's this experience like for you um, to to take this story global? Um, in the beginning, we did not know that this story would come this far. We were just living our lives, having one camera around us, doing what we do every day. And um, sometimes it was tough to show the real us. And sometimes we told the cameras to get off. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. and then sometimes we, we forgot the camera was there. Because there were so many years. It was about three years of filming. And so seeing the end result of it all, first of all, it brings back the chills and the memories. For some moments, I say, oh, my God, I need a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> then, then the other days I say, wow, also this happened. And the other day I feel the relief of I am. This story is not staying home. The world is seeing it and the people are seeing exactly what is happening home unfiltered, uncensored. It's not it's not uh, fiction. It is real story. So I am happy that our story, that they are using our lives to tell the story of many other young people in Uganda, many other young families going through the torture and the human rights violations and everything else happening at home. So it's it's thrilling and relieving and also gives us hope that our struggle is not in vain. We're actually pushing the story of Uganda outside the borders and going against what the government would want. They blocked Facebook. They don't want, they have raised taxes on using social media apps. It is very expensive to buy MBs and data. So they have excluded young people from using social media in so many ways. Having this story break the boundaries and the barriers and breaking the borders of Africa and coming to the whole world just makes me feel like Yes, we are a step forward in the struggle of uh, relieving ourselves of dictatorship. Well, look, uh, we, we really uh, encourage people to check out the, the movie when they can, uh, Bobby Wine, The People's President, but also just to follow your continued work uh, as you've powerfully made the case today. This is both something that the United States has influence over, um, and it's also kind of connected to really a global movement right now uh, of people that would like to see respect for basic universal rights and, and democracy. So thanks so much for being with us here today. Thank you very much Thank for you, having ben. us. Thanks again to Bobby and Barbie for coming by the office uh, doing the interview. I'm sad I missed that one. Just great to see those pe- wonderful people yeah. um, and wish them the best. Uh, I, uh, I want to say, Tommy, speaking of our mushroom conversation, um, I have something to plug. What do you got? Which is my two-hour appearance on the Escape Hatch pod. What's that? Uh, that is uh, our friend Jason Goldman's podcast. Oh, uh, okay, where, yeah, yeah, sorry. Like they watch movies and go fucking deep on the rewatch. I thought it was called like No Dune. It was called Dune Pod. Okay, and it's now it's changed to Escape Hatch because they they talk about obviously more than the movie Dune. We spent over two hours in the movie Her, and on the subject of AI companionship. Okay, so this thing will be hitting your feed soon, and it, yeah, maybe you go to the same restaurant Janet Yellen was at, like my. Two hour hot take uh, on it. her will. We'll, I think the podcast is longer than the movie, which is the way <laughs> that, that might be yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say it was like an aliens pod. Yeah, no, no, no. But yeah, well, Jason's very smart. One of the smarter tech one people. One of the smarter guys you've ever met. And with, one so. of the only tech people I've met with like a true conscience. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and um, hates David Sachs more than we do. Fair to say. Yeah. Because he actually possible. knows him. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, unlike us, you just. And Jack Dorsey. From, from afar. Okay, that's it for us uh, this week, and talk to you next week.